hello everyone. We're doing a little bit different this time. We're gonna do an actual in-person. You get to see us and I have a guest speaker. So uh, I have Valerie here with us as well. Valerie, if you wanna take the screen down and highlight us, we'll get started. Get everything moved around. Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is a new format. I said this, we're actually getting to see our faces as we talk about this because we're having a conversation. And I have my good friend Rob Bexley here with me. And we're going to be talking today about trademark and what that all means. So for those of you who don't know us, we're Rock, Paper, Scissors. We're a branding and marketing firm based in Lawrenceville. And this is our new recording studio as well. I love it. It's really nice. And Rob gets to be our first guest. So yeah, we have some fun. So jealous. <laughs> it's fun graphics to be able to do more of this so we can actually connect with people. So uh, with that being said, Rob is a good friend of ours and a client and mm -hmm. a lawyer we work with here in Lawrenceville. And he's going to share about trademark today. So, um, do you want to give us a little overview about sure. Bexley and Deloach and all your good stuff? Absolutely. Uh, so, yes, we are a boutique law firm uh, located here in downtown Lawrenceville, Georgia. And we, as a boutique firm, we're very selective with the type of clients we take on, and the types of cases that we do. While uh, trademark is trademarking is not exclusively what we do, we do do a heavy uh, amount of trademarking, both registration and litigation, um, and education. We educate a lot of clients, business clients, small business, uh, and large businesses alike, nonprofits, about what it means to trademark clarifying the differences between the various types of intellectual properties such as trademark, copyright, mm -hmm. and patent, which people use these terms interchangeably. Um, we're a small firm, but a small firm with big ideas. So uh, we work really well with rock, paper, scissors in that exactly. regard. Well, and one of the reasons we have Rob here is we got the, the benefit and the joy of designing their logo. Oh, so, it's an amazing logo too. So Valerie, we're so happy with it. <laughs> Which is what I, we put it on everything. <laughs> so I'm going to have Valerie share the logo. And Rob, you went through the process of trademarking your logo. And it yes. wasn't super smooth, no. which is even a better reason to yeah. share this story. So we're going to start with this story because I want you to mm -hmm. kind of see what the logo looks like and tell us what happened. Okay. And then we'll get into a bunch of of all the questions. We have a bunch sure. of frequently asked questions we're going to ask. Okay. okay, so we went through the process mm -hmm. and the rock, paper, scissors process, it's really amazing. They uh, interview us, they get to know who we are as people, our culture, what we're looking, how we're looking to represent ourselves to the public, which is really what you want in a logo, um, which is the whole basis of trademarking is taking an image um, and taking that and making it to where that represents who you are in the public sphere in the marketplace. Uh, we didn't have a lot of things we were really liking at first, but then they came up with this as this, uh, like lightning in a bottle, trade or uh, um, notary seal uh, type of image that had uh, lots of little flourishes and a big B and D in there for Bexley and Deloge. Deloge um, is Jennifer Deloge, my my law partner, and we loved it immediately. We I think we had like a couple tiny little suggestions, but by and large, it was good to go, print ready. And like I said, we put it on everything. We have it on signing mats, on our uh, face masks, uh, pins, just everything. We love it. And as trademark attorneys, we as as one would do, we were so proud of this. So we paid uh, really good money for it, um, uh, well-earned money, I might add, but we wanted to trademark it. We, we wanted to protect our image in the public sphere. While we're mostly a local Georgia firm, we do do a lot of work to throughout the country. I can do trademarks from anywhere, any of the 50 states. I don't have to be licensed in California to be able to do a trademark as, so long as I'm licensed here in Georgia. So I have clients throughout the entire country. I can even have clients in, throughout the world. So we do need to have a, a national presence with our uh, logo. Uh, I went to go a trademark it. Uh, I went through all the process, which I know how to do, obviously, and I get a rejection, what's called an office action, the dreaded office action. And they said that it was substantially similar to another registered logo for a law firm out of Massachusetts. And if she's able to, I'd love yeah. to show her what Valerie, their logo bring that up? looks like. 
Okay, now this is what has caused uh, about a year's worth of headache. Um, to the average person, these don't look really anything alike. Uh, you have a B and a D, sure, and they're next to each other in the same order. And the B and the D both have that sort of little flirt, yeah. that little tail mm -hmm. off the top. But beyond that, there are no similarities. Um, the biggest problem was they are a law firm. I don't remember their names, but uh, if they were anybody else, if they, were, if they made tires or, or sodas or anything other than law, it would not have been an issue. But because there's a B and the D and they had that little tail and because they're next to each other and they're lawyers, uh, they rejected us. So we had to go through a real big process to fix it. And we actually, what was amazing is I contacted them up directly, got in touch with one of their managing partners and I said, hey, look, can you just tell the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office that you don't believe that there's a conflict? Because you can do that. You can actually get the other party to give you permission to use it. And they said, you know what? We're using a new logo now. We really don't even like that old logo. Uh, we'll cancel it for you. And they did. I actually gave them... Uh, a few hundred bucks to a local charity uh, for, for being so awesome. But once they canceled it, we were, it was a clear path forward. But something as innocuous as those two can cause a rejection. And we paid, you know, thousands of dollars for an amazing logo just to find out that we might not even be able to use it without getting a... Uh, cease and desist letter or some sort of takedown or even God forbid being sued for infringement. Uh, so we experience the same things our own clients experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's interesting and we're going to get into this because not every brand really has to go through the trademark process. Mm -hmm. You want to do national work. So it really makes sense to do that. So we'll get a little bit into to that, why you should, because it's not for everybody. So I don't want people to hear that story. Like, oh my God, we have to do this yeah. immediately. We have to figure out what's going on. But you'll also hear something that we say a lot of times is we as a design firm, mm -hmm. we are not trademark attorneys. <laughs> if you want to trademark it, you need to bring in your partner. So yes. that's why we wanted to bring in partners because we get enough questions about what this is and what that process is. And we can be a lot more proactive and we have some offerings that we're going to be able to roll out with our partnership. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into that. But um, what I really want to do is find out from you, why should somebody, we hit a little bit on, when yeah. do you recommend getting the trademark versus not sure. getting a trademark? Okay, so a trademark really is broken down into three components. So first off, uh, a, a crash course in trademarks. There, you have three types of intellectual property, really. You have trademarks, um, copyrights, and patents. We do copyrights and, and trademarks. We don't do patents. Okay. Patents are a special type, uh, requires very, very special type of lawyer, has to get a special type of license. Patents are for inventions. So any new design, uh, most inventions nowadays are actually computer code and uh, DNA mm -hmm. uh, for like plants and medicines. Um, then you have copyrights. Copyrights are original works of art or literature or music. So if you write a book, you may make a painting, comic book, write a song, that's copyright. Just because you have a manual doesn't necessarily mean that manual is copyrightable, but it could be. Um, then you have trademark. Trademark is exclusively a marketing concept. So it is the name, the slogan, and the logo which represent a, a uh, company, its goods and services, the origins of where those things come from. So what the analogy I always tell people, the example I give people is Nike. So you have the name Nike, that's trademarkable because that's their name. Um, their slogan, just do it. And then you have the little swoosh. If you see any one of those three things, your mind immediately goes to Nike, to shoes, sporting goods, things like that. Um, if you hear the word um, Firestone, you're, you automatically think of tires. Um, and, and logos play a huge part of that because we're, as a, humans are very visual creatures and we, we, see a, we see that swoosh, we immediately think of Nike. Our sign outside of our law office doesn't have a big Bexley and Deloitte shop. We just have our logo, uh, which is that the notary seal type thing, because we know that people driving past our law office aren't going to have time to write down a uh, name and a phone number and an email address. We're not on a billboards. We don't do the billboard things. But when they see that logo, 
and they see it on uh, bags or, or masks or anything like that, their brain will start processing almost subconsciously associating that logo to our services. And hopefully the goodwill and uh, expertise and experience that comes along with it. Uh, so when so that's the crash course of what a trademark is. People should get trademarks when they have established a level of goodwill that they want to protect at a national or international level, especially when they feel like they are in a market which is especially prone to uh, confusion. Um, assertion of goodwill or um, a lot of internet com competition. So a local mechanic may not need a, a trademark as much as somebody who it has a online business selling a particular type of consultation. Um, restaurants really need uh, logos and uh, I can give examples of what a very specific example of why we um, you know, a restaurant might need it. Um, and every company that wants to really preserve their goodwill that they have spent a lot of time, energy and money uh, developing in the community. Uh, also, if you pay a lot of money for a logo and you're really proud of it, you know, it's it's really good to safeguard it. You know, you buy a nice car, you you want to lock it up. You don't want people to steal your car. You, well, you don't want people to steal your brand either. Awesome. Yeah, no, and that's huge because I think that's a big question of like, should I, should I not? Um, which I want to lead to, I've, we've had clients who've had trademark and then they've dropped it because they decided... Well, I'm not going to go national. Do I need to renew this? Do you do you recommend that? And can they get it back? Sure. Um, so a lot of people will trademark at a state level. Georgia does do state level trademarking. I think it's a waste of money. Uh, yeah, it protects you at the, at the state level. But in today's uh, international market, in today's global technology, almost anybody that has a web presence mm -hmm. Is, is a national product. Yeah. Um, furthermore, there are certain uh, trademark disputes that are bi-coastal that mm -hmm. can cause issues. And, and this is, it goes back to actually a, a famous in trademark circles, but there is a uh, famous restaurant out in California called Dan Tannins. Mm -hmm. And then there's a guy out in, here in Georgia that also wanted to create a uh, restaurant called Dan Tannins, but they're sp spelled differently, but they sounded the same. So when somebody went to a restaurant here in Georgia, they only had restaurants here in Georgia. And Dantana's in California only had restaurants out in California. But people thought they were the same restaurant. And so, uh, and they sold the same similar types of food. So even though they're completely, could not be in farther territories, you still had one company that was sort of piggybacking on the goodwill and reputation of a high-end brand restaurant sure. out here. Um, so it'd be like if you want to create a Chinese restaurant and you wanted to call it Benihana's, but you spelled it B-E-N-N-Y, you know, H-A-N-N-A-S, like Benihana's, you you're not going to get that trademark. In fact, you're going to get a, a pretty nasty and cease and desist letter because it, you just can't go around pretending like you're another company to get Part of their goodwill. So even if you have a local company, you still may um, have a need for protection in case somebody in another part of the country creates a similar business that wants to piggyback off your good work. Okay, no, that's good to know. Because yep. that's the, and so you really have to think about the vision of your business. Yes. Where is it going? What are you doing with it? And what mm -hmm. industry you're in? Which is why it's important to talk to people like Rob to make sure that everything is in. Sure. It, it's a wise choice because you sort of say. If it's not worth your money, he's not gonna. He's gonna tell you not to do it. Yeah, no. And it, a good trade, a good trademark attorney will do that. Absolutely, it's they're not cheap. They mm -hmm. they can get. They're not as ex nearly as expensive as patent, but they're a lot more expensive than a, a copyright. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking, you know, usually um, between fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars per trademark. Mm -hmm. um, and the the thing is, if you are a new business and you you were just starting out, yeah, you probably don't need a trademark. I mean, you have a sort of what's called common law trademark, mm -hmm. where if you created something, it's yours, but it's harder to prove it's yours. Mm -hmm. Having an actual trademark registration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office gives you the presumption of ownership. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between having a car 
and telling the cop that it's your car versus having a car and producing your title for your car. One's going to have, a, there's two different conversations you're about to have. Um, the same is true with trademarks. Um, if you are established, you start recognizing that you're starting to scale up. Um, you've paid some really good money for a very distinct and recognizable logo, or you have a very distinct and re recognizable trade name, then yes, absolutely um, consider, at least talk to a trademark attorney, pay it for an hour's worth of consultation to find out, is this right for you now? Uh, because an ounce of prevention is absolutely worth a pound of cure, especially in this area of law. Absolutely. So with that being said, what is the difference between the little TM, the C with the yeah. circle, and the R uh, That's a great question. circle so that people understand the difference between all those symbols sure. that you might see on a logo? Technically, none are required mm -hmm. uh, under law. They used to be the little C with the circle means copyright. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that if you didn't have that little C with the copyright on it, then your work wasn't copyrightable really famous case on that is George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. At the end of the movie, they forgot to put copyright 1960, I think, eight on it. And immediately it went into the public um, domain. Anybody, you, if you take Return of the Living or Night of the Living Dead right now and put it on DVD, you can sell it legally. Um, and it has, and that's no longer, that case actually caused it, well, that's no longer the case. The TM means trademark that you are in the process of trademarking it, or you're at least letting the world know that I have a trade, I have at least common law trademark, or I'm in, I'm in the process of trademarking this. So beware. The R with the circle around it, that's the only one really that if you use that and you don't have it registered, I don't know who would bring a suit against you. I don't know what the punishment would be, but that means you're actually registered. It means you have a registration number, you've gone through the process, you can look it up on the USPTO and uh, you, can, you can put that little thing next to it. Uh, we, we don't put it next to our logo because we know we're registered and I don't really want to redesign everything um, to add that yeah. to it. Um, but uh, some people are really happy about that little R and they're really proud of it. But honestly, none of those are required. So but, as a designer, I hate them. Yeah, no, they just really take That was away. one of our questions because a lot of times it does. You have to reprint things. You have to go back in. It also changes your logo from being centered and not centered. Yeah. So that's really good to know. And a lot of times if a client is contemplating doing a trademark, we'll go ahead and put the TM on it yeah. um, and start it because whether you decide to do it or not, then at least publicly we've said, hey, we're considering it. Yeah. Don't take it. And we have a time in the beauty of technology. We have time and date stamps on everything because at some point we've emailed it to you mm -hmm. and we can say it originated on this date. Exactly. All of our Zoom meetings, we presented it all there. So that's a nice thing from a legal standpoint. We yep. can mark when it started so much easier. Than Absolutely. Because the USPTO wants to know when you're doing the registration, the first time it's ever come into existence mm -hmm. and the first time it was used in commerce. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was designed on August 15th, 2020, but because of delays or whatever, mm -hmm. the first time it went on a package that got sold on the internet might've been five months later. Mm -hmm. So they wanna know the difference between those two dates or, um, when you're registering. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and it can, that's one of those ways where you can have a conflict very quickly mm -hmm. if there is, it's who had it first. And so yeah. that's why we'll yes. put it out there, even if you're considering, okay, let's go ahead and put it on there. Even if we don't put the trademark on there mm -hmm. and we have it publicly used, yes. that still issues it. So that's just, and one of the reasons we usually do the TM, because typically you're going to want to, event, most people, if they're going to spend the money, want mm -hmm. the R on it. Then we've also figured mm -hmm. out where that's going to go and how does it balance and what does that look like? Yeah. And at the end of the day, it is considered intellectual property. Keyword there is property. This mm -hmm. is a possession. This is an asset of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're ever positioning your business to be sold or to um, to be merged with somebody mm -hmm. or get an investor, showing that you have a um, trademark registration mm -hmm. adds to your uh, intellectual property portfolio and uh, assets. Mm -hmm. So while it may not be easily quantifiable, it adds a sense of legitimacy that not having it just simply doesn't have. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions before I want to get into the process. Absolutely. Teresa asked some good questions. Who's mm -hmm. listening in. So how long does a trademark registration last? So oh, it's, it's a slow process. Uh, minimum, minimum amount of time, I think it's about four months. I, I've never gotten one less. Four months, if it's perfect, runs through, no office actions, mm -hmm. and it just goes through lightning quick. And once you months. get it, how long does it last? 
Uh, theoretically, forever. Uh, a trademark, yeah, you have to re-register it every five years okay. for the first 10 years. So you re-register it at, at the uh, anniversary of the first five years, then you register it again five years later, and then it's every 10 years okay. for the rest of existence. So, so what if yeah. somebody changes their logo? Do they have to go back to that five-year process? Yep. Okay. They start from scratch. There is right. like, if you look up on uh, USPTO, everything's public. Mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's or um, some of the older companies, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, they're, they have trademark going back uh, decades. Oh, sure. And you can see the kind of uh, evolution of their logos as time goes on. And then what they'll do is either keep them alive just so people can't use them, or they'll just let them die. And that means they actually use those terms, live and dead. Um, and dead means once it's dead, it's fair game. So if you go in there and you find a dead logo uh -huh. that you like, uh -huh. it's yours. It's yours. You can have it. It's finders keepers. Yeah. And is it different from state to state? And you already recommended not necessarily doing state, go national. So if you yeah. just do the national, I the national supersedes all state okay. trademarks. And uh, that way you don't even have to worry about uh, having to deal with each individual states. Um, you get the most amount of protection at the federal level. Mm -hmm. You also get some international protections through okay. what's called the Madrid protocols and yep. international treaties that we get for other countries. Um, it's not perfect, but, and you can expand upon your trademark if you really want to spend a lot of money mm -hmm. and you, you're about to go in, international mm -hmm. um but by and large just getting a federal trademark through the uspto gives you pretty much uh national and some international protection awesome so with that can you walk us through the process you sure. said four months is the fastest you four months is the fastest uh the longest i've ever taken to get one actually approved um was about two and a half years. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, we manage our clients' expectations mm -hmm. very carefully because this is, this is a, absolutely a marathon, not a, not a race. Um, because the first step is that we have to have a consultation to review the type of trademark that you want done. So if you want um, your name trademark versus your logo, sometimes your name might not be trademarkable for a variety of reasons, but your logo might. Because yeah. you might have you know, rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, rock, paper, scissors actually is a great name that um, because when you think rock, paper, scissors in a vacuum, it doesn't tell you anything about what it does. So it's a perfect trademarkable name. It's what they call um, arbitrary or frivolous. Mm -hmm. um, Nike is that way. Mm -hmm. Pepsi, Coca-Cola. Um, but if you're Bob's mechanic mm -hmm. and you fix cars, you're not going to get a trademark on that because that is what they call merely descriptive. Mm -hmm. um, you are describing what you do. Your name is Bob and you're a mechanic. Uh, however, you may have a really banging um, slogan or uh, logo that uh, represents your company that has doesn't have anything to do with your name. And so you just uh, trademark your logo. Um, or you may have a really unique saying. So you may just be Bob's Auto Repair, but uh, you're your slogan may be something really cool and mm -hmm. frivolous. So, yeah. and people get to know you by that. Um, there is a point technically mm -hmm. that you can have a trademark that you've had for or your name for so long that it goes from merely distinctive to, or excuse me, merely uh, descriptive to distinctive, uh, a certain distinctiveness. And that, that minimum line is five years. Mm -hmm. After five years, Bob's auto repair may become so locally famous that you can prove through advertising and, and marketing and uh, news reports and uh, awards you've gotten that when people think of Bob's um, auto repair, they think of you. There, even if there are other Bob's auto repairs mm -hmm. out there, they still think of you. So I can't think of any really immediate uh, examples off the top of my head. Um, but you, if you go to the grocery um, market, uh, grocery store, and you just see like something that's just like says it's like white marshmallows or something like that and, and it's trademarked it's probably because they've been around for 20 years and that's just when you think of it that's what it is so you have to pick the piece that you want it to be and once you've yeah. picked it what is what do you then do with okay. the name logo or sure so we know, once we once we have the consultation we decide we help you understand whether or not 
it right off the bat whether or not it's trademarkable because we'll be able to know right off the bat if it's not trademarkable um so bob's auto repair comes in and we're like no bob sorry uh you know we can't yeah. do this but maybe he gives us some more details when we can uh then we do a trademark search we um go through the uspto um website we do internet searches we use proprietary software to find not only exact matches but similar sounding matches because they sounds actually do matter with trademarking uh similar industries conflicts with uh names that are variants of it maybe even there's a foreign name to it uh that is the same thing but it's just in a foreign language well that wouldn't be trademarkable either once we get all the information we have um and we put on the registration the application uh, it takes about a week for it to get uploaded into the USPTO system, and then the wait happens. It may take about two months to get assigned to uh, a examining attorney. So we have actual attorneys with the USPTO who are looking at these. It may take them a month to review it, and then we'll be put into what's known as the Gazette, um, Trademark Gazette, which is a public document, online document, um, to give people an opportunity to dispute it mm -hmm. and to challenge it. Okay. Um, once it's gone through 30 days of that, um, you have probably about another 30 days, if it's not challenged, to actually get your certificate in the mail. Okay. Uh, that If there's a problem, there's what's called an office action, which means okay. the examining attorney says that there is a uh, it's uh, going to cause some market confusion, or there's, there's this problem, or this problem. You have six months to um, to fix it, and okay. yeah, and then that's where things kind of get hairy because these office actions take a lot of time to respond to sometimes, and you know, we have a lot of clients, so we may take three or four months to be able to get to your office action to make sure. a response, and so then we send that in, and then they come back with a response maybe two months later. And then we have another six months to address the response. And that keeps going back and forth until uh, either they say, we're not responding to this, it's closed, we're done. And then we can appeal that to what's called TTAB, which is uh, the appeals board. And then at, that takes about two years to go for the start to finish, two to two and a half years. And then if they reject it, you can then actually take it to um, federal courts which will take one to two years. Uh, so you can actually, if, if it went all the way to the Supreme Court, or at least Court of Appeals, uh, it could take it could be about, that whole first 10 years. It could be 10 years. Yeah, you could actually spend 10 years trying to get your logo and about uh, you know $300,000 in attorney's fees. Uh, so if you really want that logo, yeah. Well, and there's some stuff that we can do from a preventative standpoint yes. in the design process. And that's where we come from. The pound, uh, ounce of prevention is worth 10 tons of cure. Uh -huh. uh, is doing that trademark search. Mm -hmm. Is making sure that there aren't any other industries using the trademark and the mm -hmm. name, the slogan, or logo. Um, making sure that's distinctive. So we actually give a lot of marketing advice. Mm -hmm. um, I have a business background, a business degree. Mm -hmm. And so we'll work with clients that uh they're they've been using a certain name for a long time and now they want trademark and i'm like there is no way we're going to be able to trademark this they're just everybody's using it um already it's just it's saturated and then we tell them like look you don't want to use this name it's not doesn't separate you out from your competition what's a new name we can help you rebrand well we don't do the rebranding but we would refer them to rock paper scissors and say hey look you needed a complete overhaul of rebranding mm -hmm. um go to them come up with a new name mm -hmm. a new name for your products a new slogan new logos and then come back to us and we'll take care of the rest mm -hmm. and that's it comes comes back to that whole what is your vision for the long term yes. if you're going to go national if you're going to go bigger then yes we absolutely want to pull in those services to be proactive if you're just going to do a local business and it's not going to be online it's okay you might have some conflicts you could get a cease and desist and i love cheap teresa's yep. comment it could be cheaper to have your logo redesigned absolutely if you oh, get yeah. hung, hung up and all of that mm -hmm. sometimes it's worth we don't always recommend rebrand but that would be a point where we'll be like all right let's change litigation this. if my minimum my my initial retainer for litigation is seventy five hundred to ten thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah, uh, at, at four hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> well, however, is, depends where it is. If you're a big brand and has signage and all, oh, sure. it could be a lot more. It well, might be worth it. Exactly. But. You know, if you have you know forty locations and uh, you know, and it costs it would, a total rebrand would cost you you know a hundred thousand dollars. 
Yeah, it, that's that's absolutely worth it. If the difference between a cease and desist and rebranding is the difference between paying me ten thousand and rock paper scissors five thousand, that's just a business decision at that point. Exactly, exactly. And then one other question I want to ask us: so, what's the relationship between trademarking a name and incorporating under that name? Sure, um, there's not a lot to be honest with you in the state of Georgia. You can incorporate or get an LLC or whatever, register with the Secretary of State, just about any name that isn't already taken by another business. They don't do searches uh, outside of their own database. So if uh, you, if for some reason there wasn't a PepsiCo uh, registered in the state of Georgia and you wanted to call yourself PepsiCo uh, LLC, they'll let you. Now, expect that cease and desist letter from PepsiCo later on. Yeah. But the Secretary of State doesn't really uh, monitor or police those conflicts. Um, in fact, it can be really easy to work around a, a conflicting name with this. It's so easy to get around another name. So if you have somebody has ABC Corp uh -huh. uh, and you want that name in the state of Georgia, all you have to add is ABC Corp Georgia and boom, they'll accept it. Okay. So... There's some loopholes. There are um, a lot of loopholes, but that's why you have lawyers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, Rob, thank you so much for no, yeah, today absolutely. and sharing this because it's such good background information and it's all about prevention. Oh, How absolutely. do we really make this something that is, you know, should you do it? Should you not do it? Is yeah. it worth doing that extra search? Because there are some extra fees that go into it, but sure. sometimes it's absolutely worth doing that. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll set, share Rob's yeah. contact information. And then I uh, want to give everybody a shout out, uh, Valerie, if you want to pull up. We don't have dates yet, but we're going to keep with bringing in partners yeah. because we want to share more information. We're going to have Accessibility join us in September, and they are the leading web accessibility uh add-on tool that it's, it's amazing um but they're going to come and present and talk about how do we make websites more accessible mm -hmm. and it's probably one of the easiest things that i've ever had to share on a website and i haven't been able to say that in a long time it's literally we put a piece of code and the next day it's working and it's just a small annual fee so if making sure that your website is accessible, which is critical. And actually Rob mm -hmm. probably attended this, you know, we put ramps in front of our older buildings so people can get into them. Yep. We need to do the same thing with our websites. And I actually have an easy solution for it, which I never can say that. So they're gonna come out and they're gonna tell us a little bit more about what that means and how to really make sure that your website can be read by everyone because 25% of people are disabled and that's 25% of buying power out there. That is a big enough segment that we absolutely need to pay attention to this and we should take care and of it. I of litigating ADA claims. I make so much money off ADA claims from people who don't have ADA compliant uh, businesses. So listen there. <laughs> so, so we'll stay tuned for that. We'll have dates that come out in the next week for that. So thank everyone for joining us today and we'll be back next month. Thank you.